You guys are troopers. It's the almost the end of the second day, and you're here for a talk. This is uh, this is impressive. Uh, welcome. Uh, I am T Prophet, and my slide deck is stuck. Awesome. There we go. Great. Um, so I write for 2600. I have a column called. Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, great. There's a it's supposed to be a lapel mic or something. Uh, yeah, no lapel mic. So uh, the lapel mic is me projecting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys can't hear in the back, just go like this, and uh, <laughs> I'll uh, talk a little louder. Uh, I'm a columnist for 2600, the Hacker Quarterly. Uh, it's one of the oldest hacker publications uh, in the world. And we are on Kindle and on Dead Trees, but not online, really. So uh, many of you may not have heard of us if you started a little later in the industry. Uh, I lived the last three years in Beijing, which was kind of an interesting uh, turn in, turning point in my career. Uh, and one of the things of li about living in China is that you find out really quickly how much you don't know. So after three years, I know some of what I don't know. Uh, I'm not a full-time InfoSec professional, so I have a reasonable degree of clue, but that doesn't mean that I'm uh, in-depth uh, with security in particular, which uh, means you know, a more broad viewpoint than most people. And uh, I had a non-compete with my last company that's a very long one since I was in research. And uh, so I'm currently working on an MBA, which my last company is paying for, uh, while I wait that out. Uh, so this, uh, just not to waste your time, if you're here for the wrong reasons, I want to make sure that you understand the goals and the non-goals. Uh, this isn't a technical presentation. Uh, the, the intent here will be to get you ramped up uh, on how to think about China um, and to get that information from somebody who can give you a first-person perspective. Uh, I'd like to help your conversations with business guys who may be making decisions about whether you should go into China or not in your particular company. Uh, this is a really risky place to be, and it's a really risky place to do business. So I'll try to help you think the right way about what can be your risk. And finally, um, I'll help to inject uh, what I think is really a needed degree of skepticism into some of the hysteria uh, that we've seen surrounding uh, uh, China. Uh, China isn't the USSR. Oh, awesome, there's a mic. Let's see if this works. <laughs> oh, okay, I put this on the lapel like so. Just do crunchity crunch. All right, let's see if this works. Can you hear me a little better now? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I'll try to point this the right way. Um, so, uh, what I there's a few things. Uh, thanks. Crunchy to crunch. She has a degree in that, you know. Oh, you got a degree in this? Terrific. Um, and that degree makes me sound better. Great. Uh, so one thing you will learn in China, uh, one of the first things you'll learn in Chinese is mail, uh, which means don't have. And so I don't have any exploits to release. I don't have any reports that are hysterical about the Chinese army and what bad stuff they will do to you. Uh, I'm not uh, plugging a consulting company or, or any services or white papers. Uh, if you already work in China, if you already live there, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot here that's new. Uh, and uh, if any of you are Chinese, um, this is just a kind reminder. Uh, I'm speaking from a Western perspective, and in particular the perspective of a Western company. And that's a very different perspective than uh, most people in China will hear from Chinese companies and the Chinese government. So, uh, you know, everybody hears China's big. And if you saw the Olympics uh, in Beijing, of course, they did some really big stuff. And why do I start with China is big? Because in order to understand anything in China, you really need to wrap your head around just how big a place it is. Uh, there's 1.4 billion people. This is the largest population of any country in the world. Uh, the real populations are larger than the official numbers. If you're Googling and, and seeing that it says 1.2 billion there, 
Um, it's because in rural areas, it's really hard to count people, uh, especially itinerant people who are herding yaks and that kind of thing. Um, it's a really rapidly growing economy. Just in the time that I lived there, it went from the world's third largest to the world's second largest economy. The U.S. economy is still three times bigger, but this is a really big economy, and this is why a lot of companies are looking to go into China. It's growing very rapidly, and there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, and that's a real opportunity, guys. So this is something to pay a lot of attention to. Um, you know, business guys don't make decisions to do this lightly, but they don't always consider all their risks, and that's where you can help. Uh, it's undergoing tremendous change. So it's the world's largest migration from countryside to city, and what this means is that people who've never been online before are starting to come online in very large numbers. Uh, some of the world's largest cities are in China. Beijing, where I lived, has roughly 30, mil uh, 30 million people. Uh, Shanghai is a bigger city. There's 34 million people there. And New York, just to give you an idea for comparison, has around 8 million people in it. So obviously, these are very large cities we're talking about with a lot of people. It's mind-blowingly mind big, and I recommend that everybody get, who has the chance go to visit because it's really uh, something unlike what you'll ever have seen before. So uh, the government has a big role in the Chinese economy, and it's a much bigger uh, involvement than most governments around the world have in both running companies and being involved in their management. Pretty much every big company in China, uh, particularly industries in strategic areas like oil, telecommunications, and so forth, are, if not directly government-owned, effectively government-controlled. So when Huawei says, well, we're an independent company, um, I don't believe that for a minute, and neither should you. Uh, the Communist Party of China, which runs the show there, is the biggest political party in the world, which isn't too much of a surprise because it's actually um, you know, in the biggest population country in the world. And laws and courts don't mean the same thing in China as they do in Western countries. And this is really important, because if you make business decisions based on what the laws are, and you rely on courts to, re to enforce those laws, actually you're already making a mistake in China. Um, relationships really matter the most uh, when it comes to essentially everything, and as foreigners, there is no guanxi for you. So these relationships are very difficult to build uh, over time. Uh, the industrial policy of China may be an odd thing to think about from an information security perspective, but this is actually the most important starting point, I think, for considering security decisions. The uh, government in China has a 30-year-long industrial policy. They think very long-term in China. Um, and because of this, uh, their intent is to support indigenous innovation across a variety of industries. Now, what does that mean? That means that they intend to either develop or acquire technology from all around the world in order to be able to do essentially everything that modern economies do inside of China. Uh, and so they look to the success of themselves in manufacturing, because China is, you know, at this point, the world's largest manufacturer. And uh, they look also to the success of India in the IT sector for how they can grow into other industries. And so one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that, you know, going back to the last slide where the government's involved really heavily, they're involved heavily in making decisions whether or not you can go do business in China. And if they're letting you into the country to do business, they've already decided that you fit into their industrial policy. And this may not be in a way that you actually want to fit in. So it's really important to consider whether you're doing it for the right reasons. So uh, if you set up shop in China, basically your intellectual property by design is at risk, and it's virtually impossible to secure it. Uh, so your adversaries, if you want to figure out who those are, are your Chinese partner companies, any, any company that you're working with for manufacturing, uh, or anybody that you're relying on for services, uh, your internet service provider, which is effectively the Chinese government, uh, your employees, who may or may not actually work for you, uh, the Chinese government, uh, and there's many, many different levels of the government and all manner of issues from local to, to national, uh, to tax and so forth, and then even foreign threats. So there may be countries uh, such as Pakistan that find it hard to operate in the United States, but find it much easier to operate in China 
And if uh, they can gain access to your secrets and your confidential information in China, that's just as good to them as doing it here. Uh, and then it's all of this, plus the usual set of threats that you would think about doing business in a Western country. So it's a lot to try to secure. Um, so I wish that uh, I could give you an optimistic picture of um, you know, how the security environment might be better, but it actually even gets worse than this, because when it comes to commercial disputes, uh, going back a couple of slides where you can't really rely on laws and the courts to, to do a whole lot, well, when it comes to commercial disputes, that's also true. So there's a company called uh, Shifu360, which is the largest antivirus vendor in China, and another company called Tencent, uh, or Tencian, uh, which makes a, a very popular instant messaging and gaming app called QQ. So why is this important? Well, QQ was doing some really bad stuff, uploading user files uh, directly to Tencent without user consent, uh, stealing personal data. You know, objectively, what they were doing was shady. And so Chihu360 uh, decided to flag uh, QQ as malicious software because basically it was doing malicious things. They were thinking from a security perspective, not really from a relationship perspective, which is a very big error in China. Uh, so Tenshin responded with an updated version of QQ, which is the most popular application in China, uh, that basically forced you to uninstall Chihu360 if you ran QQ. So uh, more than 100 million users then uninstalled their antivirus software, and they still haven't reinstalled it. And so, you know, these could be your employees inside your company um, using this particular app. So. Uh, it gets um, really complicated. So is, it, is this hopeless? Uh, is it, you know, should you just uh, full, you know, take your, uh, take your uh, cards and go home? Well, you can definitely make money in China buying Chinese stuff and exporting it. That's a really well-proven model. If you go to Walmart, most of the stuff there is made in China uh, and Walmart is making a lot of money. So this is a proven model that can be successful. Uh, if you want to sell stuff into China, that's a different matter entirely because you need to overcome some structural disadvantages that are really set up um, to favor local companies over you. Uh, and structural disadvantages aren't just legal. Structural disadvantages are also the Chinese market is really different than other markets. So you need to understand it incredibly well to make products that are relevant and that Chinese people would want to buy at the higher prices they'll be because you will not be able to compete on price. Uh, so brand image, uh, marketing, localization, these are all key. Uh, KFC is a really good case study. They've localized their menu uh, in a way that's uh, very meaningful and relevant to Chinese people. It's one of the most popular restaurants, believe it or not, in China. Uh, and their price is much higher than most local restaurants. So you are able to, to make money there. It's just, uh, you know, you've got to go about doing it very carefully. So why does this matter to you guys? You know, you're, you're saying, you're probably sitting there saying, I'm an InfoSec professional, I'm not some MBA douche. Uh, why is it that, uh, that I need to care? Well, you should actually be talking to those guys and double checking the strategy that they have. Because if you can expose some, uh, some problem or some issue that they haven't really thought about, why you shouldn't go there at all, that may actually save you a lot of InfoSec headaches later. So, you know, this is a holistic picture. You can't just own your little piece uh, with, with InfoSec. Um, you really need to think about China as the whole full picture. So uh, here's the fun part, the Chinese internet. Um, to get to that, uh, it's more like an intranet with some external connectivity through the Great Firewall. I ran some uh, you know, fairly large sites in China on local Chinese networks. Uh, so, uh, if you want to catch me off of video, I can tell you a lot about that. Um, let's just say there are more than 700 million users and the largest internet population in the world. So there's more people in China using the internet than any other country. Uh, there's only four backbones serving all of these people, and two of them are really small. Uh, those would be CERNET, which is for research and education, and China Mobile, uh, which is mostly 2G, uh, people using GPRS on their mobile phone to check email. Uh, so really, it's only two big networks, China Unicom and China Telecom, that are serving the majority of users. Um, so there's really poor peering between networks inside of China. And so if you're on China Unicom and you're going to a site that's on China Telecom, the performance can be really bad. Uh, 
China Mobile has terrible peering with essentially everyone, so it's really slow, but from, for their users, it generally doesn't matter because it's just GPRS. Uh, there's really massive oversubscription, and uh, so what that results in, if you're trying to run sites and maintain any kind of quality of service, um, you know, anything that you do from a security perspective that impacts cost is actually just adding on to a whole set of issues that are already there. So this is kind of important. You know, you're going to get hammered by devs uh, and DevOps guys in particular a lot about perf because you know the perf on Chinese internet is already so terrible that anything that you do that makes it worse is something that's really hard to get through. Um, so there's something uh, fun called ICP licensing, and as a security guy, you're probably going to end up owning this. ICP is really fun. So if you look at the bottom of any Chinese web page, there's this uh, logo, and this is the one from a, a bank called ICBC. That's a, the largest bank in China. Um, if you don't have that logo and your license number on the bottom of the page, then a phone call will very soon come to whoever is in charge of that license. Uh, informing you that the Great Firewall is going to block your entire site until you have the ICP uh, logo up. Also, if you post anything that, that isn't liked by the Chinese government for whatever reason, uh, then they're going to give a call and tell you to you better modify that content or take it down, or again, they're going to block you. And sometimes you only have an hour to respond. So why is this important? If uh, some dev intern signed up for your ICP, and that guy left three years ago and is the one who's getting the calls if there's some problem on his disconnected cell phone, then you could find your site completely offline for you know a day or three until you figure out what went wrong. So uh, as IT guys, um, as IT security guys, you need to be really in charge of the ICP licensing and stay on top of it. Make sure that you understand uh, every piece of content that's going out there. This can get really serious. Uh, there's different local versus international sites that most companies in China run, and so this, this gets interesting from an operations perspective because if you're trying to access a page from inside on a Chinese IP, it's likely to give you a different piece of content than if you do on an outside IP. Um, one of the most obvious uh, examples is a site called Baidu, which is their equivalent of Google. And if you search for pirated content from an international IP, um, China honors anti-piracy and you won't find any. But if you search from an internal Chinese IP, you'll get all the pirated content that you want. Um, and many sites are like this uh, for a variety of reasons, so it's important to pay attention. Uh, there's uh, content curation in the Great Firewall. The Great Firewall has been talked to death. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail there, but uh, it is important from an ICP licensing perspective and also from a content perspective uh, that, you know, as security analysts, you guys need to be sure that your company isn't pissing off the Chinese government or all sorts of mysterious things can start going wrong with your network. Uh, and then you know you have a problem with your relationships that need to be fixed. Technical issues usually are not only that. Uh, so there can be turf battles inside the government, and this gets really fun because um, right now the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology is flexing their muscle. Uh, the People's Liberation Army owns some stuff, and the Public Security Bureau owns the vast majority of anything having to do with regulating the Chinese internet inside of China. So uh, you can end up with sometimes conflicting uh, directives from different agencies inside of China uh, telling you to do things. and you have to make the call as to what you need to do to satisfy uh, these parties. And face is really important in China, so you can't just go back to these guys and say, well, you know, you say this and the PSB says that, and you know, which of you is right? Because then you didn't give them any face. Actually, you gave neither of them any face. So uh, you end up having to, you know, work with your business guys to, to take a bunch of people to dinner to figure out what to do in a very indirect way. So it gets, um, you know, there, these things are, are not just technical issues. There's a lot of uh, culture that you need to learn as well to be able to effectively operate. Um, real name registration is a new thing. Uh, if you're going to access the internet in China at all, uh, you now need to register with your real name, um, usually with your Chinese ID card. And I'm sure this is only used to stop rumors, which is the stated reason for why you need to do this. Uh, and then you can get a lot of off the menu services from your internet provider. Uh, you can get those through Guanxi, through some relationships, or through good luck. And I'll give you an example from my personal life. Um, I had 
a, an internet connection in my apartment that came from China Unicom. And it's the ordinary uh, China Unicom community ethernet. So basically they run one 10 megabit line to the entire apartment community that you live in and then they share that out to all the apartments and you pay some amount to plug into it. Well, because I'm a foreigner living in that apartment, uh, the Public Security Bureau installed a very special switch. The problem is that their special switch to monitor me uh, wasn't very well made and it kept overheating. And so then I would lose my internet connectivity, which was never very fast to begin with. So I complained to my Fandom, who, uh, who's my landlord, and that guy is really well connected because he's a huge boss in the China Development Bank. So he called up his buddy, who's like a vice president at China Unicom, and those guys ran a, an ADSL line into my apartment, which is something you're never supposed to be able to do. You can't have both. You can have one or the other, and basically, like, on the menu in my building was the community Ethernet, and that was it. But basically, like, you know, this, this off-the-menu service was installed in my apartment. Then I had four megabits that actually worked. Um, and it didn't have a special switch because the Public Security Bureau didn't really figure out that it was in my apartment. So I didn't have the problem with the unreliable service. So then uh, I just used, I kept the one, I didn't want to disconnect it and make them suspicious, and I would use that to just torrent massive amounts of porn, uh, which I'm sure made them really happy. And then the other one uh, I used for all, you know, running my VPN and all of the normal stuff that I was actually doing, uh, which was, you know, mostly remote administration of a lot of systems. And it sucks when things are down and you can't connect to them. So uh, networks, just to sum up, are carefully controlled and regulated, and the Great Firewall is watching everything. But you know, China has a really large population. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of things that people are trying to do online. Everybody's trying to get away with something. So uh, it just ends up being a constant game of whack-a-mole. Um, and the degree of automation behind this is pretty low. So you can usually do something for a short time that you're not supposed to be able to do until your mole gets whacked and then uh, it's on to the, the next one. Um, so Chinese internet users are kind of living in a different world than the rest of us. Um, you know, obviously they're in a, on a different internet. Uh, they also use mobile a lot more heavily than we do. So 60% uh, of, of unique page views to our sites came from PCs, so around 40% from mobile. And keep in mind that uh, the people that were hitting our sites tended to be more educated uh, and maybe heavy PC, heavier PC users than the China population as a whole. So um, it's a very high percentage of mobile users on very slow connections. Uh, they're usually stuck behind NAT or double or triple NAT. At one point, General Electric had more IP space than the entire country of China. So you know they got in late and they have very limited IPv4 space available. So. Uh, you know, your typical Chinese user is not going to have their own outside facing IP. Um, it's going to be community Ethernet, ADSL. There's also paid Wi Fi as a model. This is common on a lot of university campuses. Uh, Sanqi, 3G uh, adoption is really lagging in China behind most places in the world because uh, they, there's a special, you know, getting back to indigenous innovation. Uh, in their infinite wisdom, the MIIT decided that uh, China Mobile had to use this local homegrown standard that doesn't work anywhere but China called TDSCDMA for their 3G deployment. So nobody's bought it because the number of devices are really low. Uh, you can't sell them on a global market. And even though China's a big market, um, China Mobile's users tend toward the low end. So, um, and also, even if you have 3G, you have it through a really slow, badly peered network. So it just hasn't taken off. Um, so now let's talk about when you're managing your mobile devices, uh, what do you have to worry about? Well, you know, here you worry about the App Store and what gets on that, and then Google Play, and then what sort of you know, viruses might get on somebody's smartphone that jailbreak it and download other malicious content. Well, in China, you need to worry about that, but you also have to worry about a lot of other things. Uh, mobile is overwhelmingly Android 2.2 still. And the reason why is that that one works particularly well with the Chinese language. Uh, there's a homegrown Linux-based uh, operating system for mobile called MTK, uh, and that is on a lot of phones, particularly pirated uh, ones, which we call Shanzai. Uh, there's a lot of local brands of mobile phones, so you're having to deal with whatever um, applets that they've loaded on the phone themselves, uh, and that could be you know, a lot of things that may or may not be malicious. 
Uh, there's local app stores from local <coughs> companies. So Tenshin, uh, you know, our friends that made QQ that stole your data, uh, well, these guys run an app store. Um, there's another company called Alibaba. Uh, they're running an app store and they have their own variant of, uh, of um, Android. Uh, there's really limited government control about the patient's ecosystems right now. That is changing, uh, but it may not be changing in your <coughs> favor. Uh, it, you know, they could require that uh, some kinds of spyware be built in. Who knows? Uh, iPhone share is declining in China, interestingly enough, because uh, the Chinese language support is just a pain in the neck if you're Chinese to use an iPhone, because it's really hard to type in Chinese on them. Uh, so uh, the price is high. Um, and then CCTV, which is the government's uh, television channel, ran a big anti-Apple campaign over the last spring festival. Uh, so uh, they, their share has been dropping. Uh, I hear actually Tim Cook was in China last week trying to discuss with uh, China Telecom why that might be. Um, uh, your mic is slipping. Oh, my mic is slipping? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Crunchy crunch. Can you guys hear me better now? Good. Uh, so, popular smartphone apps, uh, there's Weixin, uh, also known as WeChat in English. You may have users right now who've downloaded WeChat, that is Chinese, uh, from the same company that makes QQ. Uh, in fact, it's integrated with QQ. You may want to do an audit. Uh, QQ and a sort of the associated app ecosystem that's built in is popular. Uh, mobile, uh, which is a hookup app. Um, China invented that, interestingly enough. It's not as conservative as you might think. Uh, there's uh, Sina Weibo, uh, which is kind of like Twitter. Taobao, uh, their local equivalent of eBay. Uh, there's a, a, an alternate browser called UC, which works really well with Chinese sites. Uh, and there's uh, one, uh, their equivalent of PayPal, which is called Alipay. Uh, you can find a lot of special purpose smartphone apps that Chinese users download. They love to download things that, uh, that are free and that they think is going to make their smartphone more safe or perform better. And so um, Battery Doctor for the iPhone is really popular. Uh, 360 Mobile Guardian for Android is really popular. Maybe your app could make that list. Um, Chinese users really love to download stuff. And the thing is, they trust where they download from. They trust Google Play Store. They trust the App Store. Uh, they trust whatever you know Alibaba App Store that they're using. So um, you know, is there content curation? Maybe. Uh, it's hard to say. So why do I go into this in so much detail? If you have an enterprise in China, uh, then you have to decide whether or not to allow BYOD. And if uh, bring your own device includes all of this kind of stuff, um, you've got a much wider potential attack surface in China with Chinese devices than you do in most Western countries. So uh, PCs, your typical PC is going to be running a pirated copy of Windows XP. It's moving to a pirated copy of Windows 7. Uh, it'll be full of pirated software, like various Chinese games that are sometimes uh, collecting confidential user data or doing other bad stuff. Um, there's going to be assorted malware. Generally, there's no effective antivirus. It'll be a, an out-of-date antivirus you know, that, that was a free trial, or th they just won't have any. Uh, for users that do have up-to-date antivirus, it's usually going to be Chihu360, which is actually pretty good. Um, it's the most popular one because it does work on pirated copies of Windows, and it's free. Uh, and you know, of course, they're going to have your ADSL, Community Ethernet, or Wi-Fi. Why do I bring this up? Do you want your users to be able to VPN in from home? Well, uh, consider what they may have on their home PC. It probably will look something like this. So popular apps on the PC, uh, QQ is the single most popular app in China. Almost everybody uses this. Uh, there's one called Ali Wang Wang, uh, which is another chat app. Alipay is uh, like PayPal. Um, there is PayPal in China as well. It's called Beibao. But nobody really uses it. Alipay owns most of the market. Uh, every Chinese bank has their own crazy uh, software that you have to install to be able to use their online banking. So you have to accept all sorts of self-signed certificates to do this. Um, every time your system boots, it's going to ask you to run something in protected mode. Uh, I could demo that if anybody's interested with my own online banking software from, uh, from China. So Chinese users are just used to, for doing ordinary things like online banking, bypassing a very large number of ordinary security controls. They just click yes, even more than Western users do. 
So um, there's, there's also a tool called the SOGO IME that nobody's really looking at from a security perspective, and almost every Chinese pers uh, PC has. Um, the reason for this is that typing in Chinese is a real pain in the neck. Uh, Windows does a terrible job of allowing for this. So SOGO is an application that almost everybody has that makes it much easier to type in Chinese. I don't think anybody's ever really looked at this to see if it's uh, ownable. Maybe somebody should. Uh, so, um, and why, do, why is that important? You know, all of your users in a Chinese office are going to have this thing installed, and they need it for a really basic function, just to type. So, um, you know, can you trust it? Maybe, uh, but it knows everything your users type. So, uh, users in China are incredibly vulnerable. Uh, but uh, the Great Firewall and NAT, you know, especially double or triple NAT, surprisingly serve as a defensive purpose. Um, it's by design with the Great Firewall, it does actually actively stop some malware. Uh, you know, NAT, not by design does. So believe it or not, Chinese computers are way less infected than they probably ought to be. Um, and most Western malware is wasting its time in China anyway because generally it's trying to steal money and the Chinese financial system isn't for local users hooked up to the international financial system easily. So there's just a limit to what of interest anybody could steal uh, from using Western malware. So uh, the sum up, uh, China's a really dynamic place. People are really creative, actually, and this is the opposite of what you hear and what you read in the media. You know, I, I read over and over, especially while I was living there, that Chinese people aren't creative and they can't invent anything, and actually, to some degree, that's true. Uh, companies generally aren't very agile, and neither is the government. But people are really agile in getting around all that. So um, it all depends on the context, and you need to really clearly understand where you fit into that context, whether people are going through your systems or going around them, uh, whether you're actually um, you know, helping users or hindering them. So don't assume that anything in China is simple or that you really know what you're doing. Uh, and. Uh, you know, people are adaptable. Companies in the government usually aren't. Malicious creativity is just generally world class. So if you look at uh, Shen's iPhones, which are you know like fake iPhones, for example, that innovation can be best in class. Uh, the fake iPhone for a while was better than the real one, and it offered dual SIM. So uh, the Chinese malware ecosystem, when you look at local malware targeting local computers, is actually almost completely separate from the rest of the world, and generally speaking, this malware is pretty good. It's pretty well made. Uh, so Chinese malware, the stuff that your users may be downloading onto their company computer, is usually after cash, fortunately, and not your secrets. Uh, malware and rootkits are just as creatively designed as anything you're going to see in the West. Uh, QQ has terrible security, it can spawn processes, like there's a lot of plugins for it. Um, you know, users will click yes to anything. So it's the biggest vector for malware. It, it actually, and then, you know, it's got a ready-made way to spread because it has your whole users list. So if you remember AOL uh, viruses uh, through AIM or MSN viruses, uh, you know, this is basically the same thing all over again, except it's on steroids with QQ because you can do just so much more. Uh, and QQ actually has this, you know, credit system that's a cash equivalent. So you can, if you own somebody's QQ, you can actually steal their QQ money. So there's a real incentive to, to own their QQ just from the outset. Uh, there are plenty of other vectors for malware, all the normal stuff. Um, you know, generally speaking, free downloads. Remember, Chinese users love free stuff. Uh, and browser hijacks. Um, Baidu uh, doesn't have uh, Google Smart Screen or any equivalent technology, so there's a lot of links to really bad stuff. Uh, so if you find a piece of Chinese malware, and this is kind of the, you know, almost the heart of my presentation, and it's not trying to steal money in China, uh, or doing something similarly transparent, like trying to steal compute resource to mine bitcoins or something like that, then this is awfully suspicious, because this isn't the kind of stuff that guys that are making malware in China normally are up to. Uh, I would suspect this kind of stuff is state-sponsored myself. Uh, and the, at the bottom in Chinese, it says shameless, which is kind of an insult in Chinese. It's actually a really big insult. But all governments do this. Uh, so um, you know, this is what uh, people in China will accuse us of, of being when we have Navy boats in the wrong part of the South China Sea. 
Um, so if you're located in China, the People's Liberation Army uh, probably isn't interested in you because it's the Domestic Public Security Bureau's jurisdiction. But the PSB does some really fun stuff. Like they'll show up in your office on a Friday afternoon and hand you a device and say, this needs to be on your network in an hour for security uh, or we're shutting off your network. And this has happened you know, to multiple people multiple times. What is this box? Who knows? Uh, you know, you're not allowed to open it, it just has to be on your network. So you as the security guy now have to make a decision. Do I keep my network online? Uh, do I have it turned off while I try to fix the relationship? Um, do we have enough Guanxi to stop this in the company? Probably not if you're foreign. Uh, or do you install the mystery device and give the PSP whatever they want for whatever reason they state? Um, we'll have a Q&A afterwards, oh, uh, just, just so you know. Guys. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, you've, you've had this happen to you. Um, uh, so your people are, but the thing is, generally speaking, the police aren't focused on your networks because people are way more useful to police uh, than your network is. And the Public Security Bureau has more leverage than any NDA you have with anybody that's signed. That gets back to the you know, second or third slide where we talked about courts and the law. Um, your people may not even work for you. They, the most trusted fixers that you have in your company might be getting paychecks from other people. You don't know. Uh, and there's really legally nothing to stop that from happening. You don't have any recourse legally. So what I would do myself if I had data that I needed to protect in China, well, I wouldn't have data that I need to protect in China because it's all going to get owned. But you know, even what you have there, if you, if you, you want to slow down how quickly it will get owned, focus on compartmentalizing who has access to what. Uh, and then also make sure that your network, you know, there is one thing about the People's Liberation Army you should probably focus on, and that is try to keep your network be, from being used as a springboard by them to get attacks out uh, to other places. Because they don't like to come from Chinese IPs, they'd rather, much rather come from other places, uh, particularly trusted networks like yours, right? So can you stop it? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you can try. Um, so, doing security research in China, there's, I uh, wanted to bring this up because there is a very well cited report that uh, is being waved around a lot on Capitol Hill from a company that I will not name, um, but uh, that, that says all sorts of uh, things that are very controversial about China and information security there. And I'd like to encourage people to do security research there and give some tips on how to do it in a way that may be less controversial and possibly yield better results. Uh, the first is really understand the culture and the context of what you're researching uh, to avoid the wrong conclusions. And this is when you get some information, you know, you can't read it through a Western lens. You actually have to understand it in the Chinese context. Uh, understanding the language is really key. Um, if you don't speak Chinese and you're relying on Google Translate, it works pretty well sometimes, but for some things it gets completely wrong. So, uh, the language is really important. Uh, you can use a, you should use a Chinese IP address from different cities and different backbones because the content you're going to be able to access will be highly variable based on where you're coming from. And finally, if you see something interesting, you'd better take a screenshot because it might not be there for long. So uh, another interesting thing about China, the move to online is very slow. And I'll use as an example, uh, paying my utility bills. If I want to pay the bill for the internet that breaks a lot because the public security bureaus switch overheated again, uh, it gets really hot in Beijing in the summer, um, then I need to actually take the physical bill to the bank. I can't take just the account number or anything. I have to have the physical bill, and I have to go to, the, to a Chinese bank, not the foreign bank, but, but a Chinese bank. And then I need to pay with cash, not with my bank card, because you know why should you be able to pay with your bank card at the bank that issued the bank card? That doesn't make any sense. You must pay with cash. Uh, and then, you know, after you take the number to to sit in the appropriate line, which is not the line for general stuff, but is the line for paying bills, then you can pay your bill that is the current bill, not last month's bill, not you know not some other bill, but the exact bill from this month with cash in the exact amount, and then it's taken care of and solved. Uh, there will be three or four forms, lots of stamps, uh, and none of this stuff will be online. It's like all done on paper still. Because China has 5,000 years of history with bureaucracy, this is a very finely developed system. It doesn't change you know, really quickly. 
particularly when there is tea to drink and mahjong to play. So uh, the wrong assumptions, um, you know, you can make some really wrong assumptions if you see some things online. And I'd like to highlight a couple that may be wrong assumptions from a particular report that I recently read. Uh, it was said in the report that because two organizations were located in Shanghai, in different parts of Shanghai, a city of 34 million people and the largest city in China, therefore they must be related. Uh, well, maybe, but that's an awfully big stretch. Uh, it was also said that a China telecom work order uh, that was issued for providing free internet service to some army office, or what was alleged to be an army office, uh, you know, meant that there was a smoking gun. Uh, but actually not, because China Telecom routinely installs, you know, there, this is no different than any kind of work order you would find uh, for any sort of telephone service being ordered. You know, the actual document that was cited is nothing suspicious at all. Um, it was also said in this report uh, that there's this place that's a borough, borough of Shanghai. I don't know what a borough of Shanghai is. There's no such thing. Uh, and that the province of Hubei, which is one of the largest provinces in China, was located inside this borough in Shanghai. Well, actually it's not. It's thousands of miles away. So, you know, why is knowing China, you know, I'm not just poking a stick in the eye of people that have written reports. I'm sure they worked really hard on this thing, maybe. But um, the, uh, the problem is that if you make assumptions based on wrong geography, there's actually high variation in what you may be looking at, depending on the geography you're looking at. Uh, things that are inside the federal cities of Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Tianjin, and Chongqing are generally way more important than things that you'll find in provincial cities, for example. So knowing the geography and who's administering things and what chains of command are likely there is really, really important. Uh, and if you're making mistakes like putting you know, Hubei in the wrong part of the country, uh, particularly when Hubei is not federally administered and Shanghai is, uh, you can make some really, really wrong assumptions about a lot of things. So uh, finally, I'll give you some fun stuff to play with if you guys are interested in starting to do some research in China, um, because apparently the uh, report that I read didn't use some of these very popular sites in doing the research. And so maybe the, the research that they did uh, wasn't uh, as comprehensive as it could have been. Um, so Chinese users, just to get inside their head, usually are not using uh, sites that are from Western services because the performance tends to be really slow. Remember the oversubscription problem? That's really magnified when it comes to oversubscription of international links. So it's just really slow and crappy to access anything outside of China from within China. And then the Great Firewall tends to block random things like, you know, so the, the performance will be even worse and it'll take a long time for, for pages to load. And then even if they're willing to wait for all of that, then, you know, the site's in English and most Chinese people don't read English very well. They learn some in high school and then forget it as soon as they pass the Gaokao. So um, generally speaking, unless it's in Chinese uh, and it's in China, they're not going to be using it. So uh, Twitter, there's an equivalent called uh, Weibo. Uh, there are two different companies, uh, Tenshin uh, and also Sina, uh, that make uh, these platforms. And they're like Twitter, but much more rich. There's a ton of information that ends up there. And there's a lot of whack-a-mole that goes on. So if you really want to learn about China uh, in a very real-time way, and you want to get some of the most up-to-date information that's most likely to be censored, these are the places to be looking. Uh, Skype, uh, also known as Skypey. Um, is from a company called Tom.com in uh, China. Uh, Microsoft licensed the technology to them and they do all the dirty work for the PSB. Is there dirty work? Yes, uh, there is. There's some independent research that has confirmed that. Um, so Facebook, uh, nobody really uses that unless they went to university overseas. So like the, the top upper crust elite of China will get VPNs and still stay on Facebook. But the majority of people there use a service called Renren. Uh, which is very similar. Uh, the New York Times, you know, that we would look at, um, actually Chinese people prefer to look at giant news aggregation sites uh, with a ton of links on the front page because it's a pain in the neck to type in Chinese, remember that. Um, so the most popular one is NetEase163.com uh, uh, and they'll be looking, at, looking for their news there and uh, seeing that from a variety of sources. Uh, Google, it barely exists in China anymore. Um, 
It's used very little. Uh, it's actually not a very good search engine for anything Chinese because they, they get blocked so much with their crawlers. So uh, you would need to use Baidu if you want to find anything. That's the, that is the equivalent of Google. So when you're doing your research, be in the right places. Look for the right things because if you're using Western tools and making Western assumptions, uh, you're just going to end up looking like an idiot in China. Um, so if you want to contact me, um, my LinkedIn is uh, tprofit, my Facebook is tprofit, my Twitter is tprofit. Uh, if you want to email me, I'm tprofit at tprofit.org. Uh, if you want to hire me, I'm not available until March 1st of next year. I'm still under an uncompete, but I'm working on an MBA, so I'm not available anyway. Uh, and. Uh, with that, I think there's another room they take us to for Q&A, uh, or do we do that here? There's another room? Yep. Yes, okay, good. So uh, if you wanna ask me questions, uh, come to the Q&A room for OMFG Q&A. Well, you, uh, you have this room for 12 more minutes. Oh, I have this room for 12 more minutes, so I guess, uh, really is that okay with you or not? We don't really need the Q&A room if you're able to do all your questions here. Okay, well I'll take questions here and then we'll move to the Q&A room uh, afterwards if, if there are any questions. Yes. Uh, do you ever go to the XCOM security conference in Beijing? No, that? that's in the Chinese language, and my Chinese is really bad. They have they have little English translators. Like if you go there. Oh, the simultaneous translation? No, I never went. Um, you know, keep in mind that security is is part of what I did, <laughs> but it was, you know, I I ran basically the entire IT enterprise for a, a major multinational company's Beijing office, mm -hmm. and that was uh, like security is part of it, but I was a pretty busy guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, do. Are you able to discern the amount of clout that local people have from some of the social networks that they use there for figuring out who you should contact for certain things? Or do they keep a lot of that stuff offline? Because that's offline. Bunchy is not online. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just like social networks, it, it's really good that you bring this up because actually how you get things done in China is about who you know and what relationships you have with these people. It's not. Um, you know, you can't really approach people the same way as you can here. So, um, this is not done online though, it's really murky, a lot of it involves money. Uh, as a Westerner, you just don't get involved with that stuff. Like, even if you've lived there, you know, for two or three times as long as I have, and you speak Chinese much better than I do, uh, you know, there's this really clear distinction between foreign and Chinese, and so, you know, there, there are some sandboxes as a foreigner you just shouldn't try to play in, and you probably can anyway. Yeah, so in the back. In the mystery box, um, we also had to supply our VPN tunnel passwords and the admin accounts for equipment we had in China. Uh, where was this, and uh, can you provide any more detail? Just just to, you know, um, kind of compare notes. Beijing. But it's just like a sales office. Okay. Do they tell you where in your network they have to be plugged in? I mean, is it just <laughs> interior space? You have to have connections from your DMZs, or so? Fortunately, I got lucky uh, in that we were a big enough target that our connection ran right through a police station, <coughs> uh, and so they did whatever they wanted to do uh, there. And we ran IPsec, so I don't know how much they were able to get. But basically, like at the egress from our building, it went into the police station, they did what they wanted, then it went to China Telecom and China Unicom respectively, since we had connections from both. And you know, I didn't really care for the most part for the stuff that I ran. It was internet facing. So if the Chinese police want to know who's connecting to our website, you know, they can get that information anyway. So I didn't see anything of any real value that they'd be able to get. For the, you know, we had our own lease line for our corporate intranet, and that was also similarly situated, but it was very heavily encrypted. So it's a, and we were never, uh, I was at least never told, and none of my predecessors were ever told that we had to supply access to that. But other companies, that has happened to. Uh, I had a colleague at a Fortune One company uh, in Beijing uh, that uh, that had a very complicated uh, negotiation with uh, the Public Security Bureau. Um, my understanding is that uh, that issue kind of went away, but you know, this is where it gets into what are your relationships and how many do you have and who do you have them with? Like, is my, big, is my Guan Xi bigger than your Guan Xi? Uh, when you're dealing with the police, like, it takes an awful lot of, um, 
it takes some pretty high level relationships to, to get them to reverse a decision. In the back. Okay. So we have all these reports that are all being hacked by China, they're stealing all the intellectual property. Do you think that's exaggerated or completely false, or is it true the way it's being presented? The way it's being presented isn't true. Uh, actually, I think that most intellectual property acquired in China is just handed over. Uh, it's a result of bad business negotiation and not understanding what the Chinese industrial policy is and how long term they think. So uh, if you have to go in in, a, in some kind of joint venture arrangement and you hand over your intellectual property to a local partner and you expect the laws and the courts to protect your intellectual property the same way that they would in a Western country, then you, my friend, just made some really bad assumptions uh, from the business side and maybe, just maybe, uh, if you had enough IT concerns you know, around what the legal environment is, uh, just from an IT perspective and a technology perspective, uh, that would derail some of these other concerns around you know, handing over intellectual property, right? So, you know, you, if, and that's why I really want to you know, help try to bridge the gap between us as inf information security people and the business guys, because if you're raising a lot of security concerns and you're presenting them in a way uh, that business people really understand, then they're going to start thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, actually I need to worry about my IP too. Uh, all the way on the left side? That's you. Me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if I was doing research, I want to do research on different segments of the Chinese networks, but public facing and, and maybe some of their natted or semi-natted systems. Are there any places that I could go to look to see where I could pivot in from? Or like, say, I stand at the box that I might may or may not already have in Hong Kong. Where would I connect from there into other portions of their internal uh, network? Is there uh, anywhere to reference that information? If you're in Hong Kong, you might as well be in Kansas. It's uh, it's there's no difference uh, really in you know Hong Kong is in China. It's it is and it isn't. Uh, there's there's increasing influence of the mainland in Hong Kong, but from a network perspective, you know, you're, you're not in China if you're in Hong Kong. So is there um, to go someplace that I could go to find where I should pivot from? Uh, I'm not going to suggest that you should own any boxes in China, but if you were to do that, that would be very interestingly useful jumping off points. Um, you know, but of course I wouldn't suggest that you violate any laws of the People's Republic of China. Okay. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the different views of trademark and copyright between um, the, the general Chinese population and how the U.S. views that? Uh, that's a very long discussion. Better taken offline. Uh, in the back. I've known you for a long time, and uh, for those of you that don't know, he's OG. He's like him up there with Gatsby and fucking Wayne and guys like that. Well, you know, I have some. I'm. I, I have a six-month sentence of. Well, I had a one-year sentence of not working, and you know, due to non-compete and receiving a large sum of money. Um, so maybe there's time to write a book. I don't know. Uh, Costa Rica is next. I have five more minutes uh, for questions. If there are any more. Okay. Um, if there aren't any more up there. I have a so yeah. you talk about if you have information in China, you just expect that it's going to get you. Somebody's going to be able to see it no matter what. But what about you know your IP if it's algorithm based things like that? Is there is there a way to do business in China without really having you know your core technology being owned up by the next nearest competitor because somebody you know says oh that's really interesting we we want to take that and then run it in a Chinese company and not let these Westerners you know have that. Well, the argument that I would make is if you're, you know, you have to worry about your intellectual property anywhere in the world getting either copied or, uh, you know, or discovered by your competitors, right? In China, it's just the delta is a lot quicker than it would be in a Western country. Um, and also, you know, the, the innovation cycles are incredibly rapid there, especially when it comes to, you know, the Shanzai ecosystem, which is, uh, you know, things like iPhone knockoffs. Like, you know, before the, the new iPhone was out, there were copies of it. So, you know, these guys move really fast. And they weren't just copies, they were really good copies, and sometimes they work better for a Chinese uh, audience than the real iPhone does because they don't suck at Chinese language input. 
So, um, you know, you have to assume, like the thing is, if you're in China, uh, the network is hostile, your people are potentially hostile, you don't know, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they're potentially, like the, the chances of somebody getting like a small paycheck from you and another small paycheck from somebody else and putting them together, it's awfully tempting and there's no punishment, particularly when the government's giving that paycheck to somebody. Um, you have no leverage with your employees because your NDA is way less leverage than anything the Public Security Bureau wants. Uh, so, you know, and basically you're dealing with a government that has, you know, a larger civil service than any government in the world. So, and, you know, with the national industrial policy of acquiring whatever intellectual property will suit indigenous innovation in growing into new areas across a 30-year time frame. So, that's what you're up against. You know, everything is hostile. So, can you make money? Yeah. If you go in with something really super awesome and you're the first to market and you market it really well, you brand it really well, uh, you have something that every Chinese consumer wants, it's relevant to them in their lives, which is something that a lot of Western companies, you know, the thing is, like, most Western products aren't relevant there, just like many of the things that I own that were really relevant in China are not relevant here. So, you know, if you've, if you've got the right product, you know, like the, we say in business school, PPP, the three Ps, product, uh, price, promotion, um, if you've got that down and you move quickly enough, you may be able to make a, and it's like a product with like a short, you know, life cycle, right? Um, you know, it's the new pet rock. And once everybody has a pet rock, you, you don't need to worry like whether somebody copies the pet rock. You had the original, by the time there's copies, like it's already played out. You know, you get in fast, make a lot of money, like that totally works. But if you've got something that you're gonna lose big if it gets copied, I just wouldn't do it there. Um, and chances are, if you're gonna lose really big if it gets copied, it's also really expensive. And this is a market where consumers don't have nearly as high a disposable income as anywhere in Western countries yet. Uh, with that, I think we're almost out of time. If there's one more quick question, we can take that. Now, <coughs> what's it like to get in trouble with Chinese authorities? <laughs> uh, there are there are actually a couple of. Um, there's a gentleman who got in trouble for <laughs> dealing pot in China. He's an American guy. He then came back here and got in trouble for dealing pot. Um, it isn't good. Uh, <laughs> if you get in trouble, you know, under like the Chinese police can throw you in jail for two years just because, and they don't need any reason. Like they can do it for any reason or no reason. It's just an administrative thing before it even gets before a judge. Uh, if you do end up in the legal system, it's not good for you because judges are not independent. So, and if you're a foreigner, like it's going to be a political case no matter what, whether you intended it to be or not. So, um, you know, it ultimately ends up uh, to the whims of people in way higher positions than you, uh, government bosses, and you'd better hope that your government uh, is able to uh, have enough leverage to be able to get you out. The problem is, nobody has leverage with China. Nobody. So, um, in effect, just don't get in trouble in China. Like, keep your nose clean and follow the law, and they actually won't bother you. Uh, so uh, if there are any other questions, I guess we'll go to the Q&A room um, for a couple of minutes. And then, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much.